be online. No, even nine people are waiting. <laughs> Where are you seeing this statistic? Yeah, so now we are live. Just a second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we are online and we can start. Uh, well, I was thinking about how to introduce you and I, uh, and now I think that uh, I will give you this opportunity to introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Dima, hello everyone. Uh, I am uh, Chief Elf Officer of Accent Partners and uh, in the in the terms of holacracy, I'm lead link in the in the in the company, uh, and today we're gonna we're gonna have hopefully a hard talk about uh, what is good and what is bad in holacracy, and also what is bad in in hierarchy. Uh, and uh, Irina, uh, can you please introduce yourself and uh, say a couple of well, not a couple, maybe a few words why why you like the hierarchy so much. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Dima. Hi, I'm Rina Nikitina. It's uh, always tough to present myself. Uh, it's quite uh, easy to do in Russian because what I say is, Hi, I'm Rina Nikitina. I'm Baba Yaga of Yuridichiski Market, legal market. And that's why I'm uh, usually opposed with partners. I'm not so big fan of uh, hierarchy. Neither of Halakasi. I'm just a big fan of good communication. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Irina. Uh, clear enough. Uh, but I'm not sure that this was really honest, but let's check it this later. And uh, now let me introduce Joe, uh, who is, uh, whom I met a week ago. Uh, <laughs> we had a call, and I understand that someone. Uh, in the world also is thinking about uh, either it is possible to use holacracy for the law firm. So, Joe, can you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Uh, hi, Dima. Hi, Irina. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe, or Jo in German. Uh, by background, I'm a lawyer, a German qualified lawyer and a mediator. I'm also a law firm consultant and facilitator in law firms for several years. So I've worked with many partners of big and small law firms. And since last October, I'm a partner of Encode.org, which is a tech and consulting company run completely run by Holacracy. But not only run by Holacracy, we also integrated Holacracy in our LLC legal agreement. So we actually take Holacracy one step further into ownership and investor rights. Um, Encode.org's purpose is going beyond employment and liberating purposeful work. And my own personal or individual purpose is I want to combine law and people and I provide a framework for change, be it as a mediator or a consultant or as a partner of Encode.org. And yeah, that's for now. I like Holacracy because it's really pioneer work in the world. It uh, offers something to, to work differently together and just uh, for this spark of innovation and doing something differently, I really adore Holacracy for a start. Uh, good. You like to do everything in a different way. Okay, uh, so let's begin from our first starting question about does the organization structure really matters? So all the companies, all the successful companies are, are, are the same, uh, I mean, in terms of, of success. And what is, which part is for organizational structure? Which part of success is uh, for the organizational structure and how it matters the, the whole organization? Who can begin? I can this? begin. Okay. Um, and I would like to draw the picture a bit bigger to answer this. So let's say how much does a self-organized uh, structure, yeah, so be it for legacy, matter for the success of the organization. And I think uh, really the success of the organization and of self-organization depends on three elements. The first element is the organization 
and this includes culture and structure. The second element are the people. Are they willing and able to follow a self-organized model? So that's the second, the people. And the third is infrastructure, be it software or rooms and so on. So yes, it matters, but uh, alongside with the three other elements and their sub-elements. Irina, do, yeah. do you have a position about that? I want to just a little bit confront of you. This is uh, all successful organization are the same. Mm -hmm. Did I get you right? Because it seems to me not. The definition of success is different with different organizations. And it's quite an interest in how organization mark their success, how they define their success. But if you come into law firms, especially national law firms, it's definitely, you know, spinning around the founding partners. The founding partners, they are guys who structure organization, who lead the organization, and who define what success is. That's why I said before, it's not about structure. It's about good communication. Because communication sucks not only in law firms, but sometimes, sometimes I see that even within the partnership, communication is the most critical thing for the success. When you say uh, national companies, first of all, which nations do you mean? I mean, Ukraine, Russia, or...? Yeah, you know, the context is I'm working with a Russian-speaking region of post-Soviet Union countries. So that's the context uh, I'm working with, and that's, this is partners that I'm very, very in close cooperation with. But I communicate quite often with my colleagues in UK. I don't know why, but communication sucks in bigger law firm too. That's why a lot of our communication is about communication in law firms and in partnership. The size is matter. Size really matters because the bigger organization you have, the bigger, pro the bigger problem with communication become. And it's really interesting. I, I really appreciate your share, her experience, how communication works with holacracy. Because I know where it lack of communication in hierarchical structures. The more level you have, the more layers in an organization you have, the more communication sucks. Um, but in holacracy, they're completely, you know, flat structure. And it seems to me, and I would be eager to know how it works with holacracy. Good. Yes. Uh, yeah. let, can we can we take one issue of that and let's try to imagine how this communication would work in in hierarchy and then uh, as opposite to that in the hierarchy? Can we take this question, Irina? We need an example. Can you give us an example? Okay. Let's say the very simple example. I I think the simplest, maybe even imaginary. Like a managing partner coming in the morning uh, to office, uh, you know, passing the reception area, client area, uh, to his corner office, and think, uh, we probably need to redecorate our reception area. Mm -hmm. so how this example sounds to your context? <laughs> Okay, so let me uh, pick this example up. Uh, wonderful. Um, so in Holacracy and in Encode.org's world, which is moving even one step um, beyond Holacracy really, you have got, let's say, three major areas for communication, Irina. One is communication or decision taking on ownership and investor rights, okay? Managing mm -hmm. partner, all the other partners are owners, and so on. Yeah, so profit distribution, and so on. The second, uh, like, um, yeah, area where you can talk about is work governance. So, who is responsible to decorate the entrance? Yeah, in the law firm, and then like responsible, who's got the authority and the accountability to do this? This would be a role. Yeah, 
and this row can decide by him, or the owner of this row can decide by him or herself alone without asking anyone. And second, Holacracy deals with work operations. So this is perhaps a project of the managing partner or even of the secretary sitting in the entrance. So she would tell people, oh, I've looked at this sofa and this whatever, yeah, painting, and this is what I'm going to do. It costs this much, this is my budget, here we go. So you have got these three main areas, and they are all, um, all decision taking takes place based on holacracy or communication is really, you do what you may do, you don't have to ask for feedback, you just go. And if others have attention, a sort of attention, they could raise it in either a governance or a technical meeting. So very structured <laughs> and very based on authority you have by role and not by position. So probably it would not be the managing partner being accountable for the entrance, but someone else. Well, to continue what Jo uh, just said, Irina, just a second, and I will um, uh, I will give you the, the opportunity to say how it usually works in, in the hierarchy. Uh, what we would do, uh, we would have a meeting, a tactical meeting, on which we usually uh, we usually I don't know decide what is the agenda of the meeting because each each, each guy has many ideas of what we can improve. Uh, we re, uh, usually we know that we have one hour of, or two hours for the for such meetings. We decide the the agenda and we pr prioritize the questions. Okay, this uh, let's imagine this is going to be the question which we will discuss. Let's re re redecorate our office, and it's my idea as the CEO. Uh, when I uh, start this conversation, I explain that we need to redecorate the office because we need this, this, and that. Uh, and next, we uh, uh, our meetings are facilitated quite strictly, and and we have a couple of rounds of of this of this discussion where uh, all all my uh, colleagues can uh, can comment on my on my idea or they can suggest their ideas or someone can be opposed. Uh, if everyone is agrees with yes we need to redecorate someone has the ideas of what we can change or maybe someone is opposed then we need to integrate our decisions maybe we need to uh, maybe it is impossible to redecorate our old office let's move to other office maybe it is the idea and we need to somehow integrate uh, all the all the issues and as a result of this discussion everyone should be agreed to the meeting uh, to, to the decision so uh, we cannot uh, take a decision by the majority. Everyone should be agreed to the to the uh, to the decision. And after that, we need to decide uh, whose role is to implement this. As Joe said, we need a role. So uh, it is not my authority to assign this to someone. We just have uh, we just must have the role. If we do not have the role, then I I am as lead link is. Um, have to have to decide how to solve that. We need to either have another meeting and make a role for that, or we need to, or we need to, uh, or I have to solve everything by myself as a little because we do not do not have a role for that. So this is how it works in 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 holacracy. Let me add one more thing, um, if I may. Yeah. Um, the even I think the even more interesting uh, situation is how much does everyone get paid <laughs> at the end of the year, for example. So how do we do this at encode.org? Yeah? First of all, um, if encode.org was a law firm, we are all partners. So there are no employed person, we are all partners. The secretary is a partner, the office manager is a partner, the head of IT is a partner, and the lawyer is a partner. So we are all partners. And then we've got a plan, an earnings plan, specifying specific criteria such as knowledge, but mostly how close are partners to the organization's purpose with their work. So this is the main criteria for what you earn, how close you are in furthering the organization's purpose. Who decides upon how much I get? I don't. Someone else does. The one who has the earnings plan advisor role. He decides. He doesn't have to ask me. <laughs> I can have attention later on, but he decides for all partner members of the organization. And um, that's it. <laughs> so it's truly distributed authority. 
Yeah, that's really interesting because the reason I left quite a cozy job as a COO, chief operating officer in a leading national law firm mm -hmm. was I had no chance, never ever be a partner in a law firm mm -hmm. because I'm not a figure there. Irina, yeah. I thought I thought you you left the the company because you were assigned to the decorate the office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you know, bigger purpose. <laughs> well, let's uh, uh, let's revert to this uh, to this question. So, what's yeah. going on in the classical law firm in Ukraine when the the managing partner decided to come in the office in the morning? and uh, also decided that uh, he don't like this office anymore and he wanted to be decorated. What's going on next? Next five years. <laughs> next five years. Mm -hmm. It depends on which law firm we're talking about, mm -hmm. but usually with strict direct order to office manager or to administrative director, it would be set by this partner. You know, we need to redecorate the reception area. And there is a contact of my designer, and she's probably my wife. Oh, yeah, yeah, she's my wife. Yeah. <laughs> my, daughter. <laughs> my daughter. Yeah, my daughter, my daughter in law, yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm just, you know, waiting you in a couple of hours with the report. Uh, how much does it take in time and in money? So, how much does it cost, and how much many? How, how, how many days we need to, you know, uh, do, uh, can we accomplish the project in two days, please? Just, you know, over the weekend. That's usually done. But it, can't, it, it can be also another situation, and a well-established, also hierarchical, but westernized uh, national law firm, the managing partner could call an executive director, and said, you know, I just wanted to put an issue of redecorating our uh, reception area to a partner's meeting agenda. Just because, you know, I've heard from one of my clients, uh, we are a little bit outdated or it's not so, you know, fresh or modern or so whatsoever. And then a lot of democratic procedure would apply. Something like you described or your meetings in holacracy system. <laughs> I would like to add one thing because um, what ENCODE really does is, of course, we use holacracy for these different um, areas of decision making. Ownership is one, work governance is the second, and work operations is the third. But what we also do as ENCODE.org is that we say holacracy is known for role without soul. So it's only technical stuff, let's say you can um, discuss, but not interpersonal issues, such as conflict, feedback, whatsoever. So what ENCODE.org does is to offer another space, as we call it, for all these interpersonal issues. Because just because Alacracy says uh, it mustn't be talked about during an operational tactical meeting, it's still there. So what we really do is that we all are convinced that this kind of communication, Irina, this is why I talk about it, like interpersonal communication, uh, difficult stuff actually, yeah, is normal and is, but there are different rules apply, more like mediation style, negotiation style, knowing your own personal differences, knowing your personal patterns, it's a lot about self-reflection and personal growth altogether. But this is separate from these three areas I mentioned, ownership rights, work governance, and work operations. So uh, the, the great thing ENCODE.org offers to the world is to say this is a separate space, and we will tell you how to deal with communication in this space. So I'm very thank you for this comment, but if, if, you, uh, if I just make to, you know, shift a little bit our discussion and the from internal issue, like, you know, reception area is internal issue, to external one and to external communication. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, uh, let's imagine that you know, clients of this law, a client of this law firm prefer to work only with this particular person. Mm -hmm. And say, you know, I like to work with Dima for all projects. And it's, you know, 
in my frame of reference, it's clash a little bit with this functional role approach that you have yes. in Holacris. Yes, it does. In, and, and in my frame of reference, in my frame of reference, uh, the clients is uh, the god who's shaping the whole business mm -hmm. of law firm. Yeah. Yes, uh, to some extent I agree, even though uh, Dima wants us to argue fierce arguments. But yes, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, I agree. This is a price you have to pay um, for this clarity of roles. I've had a similar situation where I had to hand over, <laughs> yeah, because my stage was exploring and now it's cultivating the opportunity and then it's serving the client. And indeed, yeah, we don't have a client partner as law firms have. Um, law firms usually, as far as I know, them have both. They have the client partner who stays with the client, yeah, in corporate law, in labor law, in all the issues in strategy and tax. And then you've got the, the lawyer dealing with a case, like with a labor law issue and so on. So in law firms, you really have both, I find. And in a holacracy run firm, you don't have that. Or, or we don't have it so far. Of course, you could probably introduce a role, yeah which stays the same, but it, it will be different. And that's, that's a price, yeah? Uh, well, you know, when I hear, when I hear s such uh, such uh, examples of uh, when the client want to work with a particular partner, I remember how I worked in one company and uh, we had a client who wanted to work with a particular partner. Uh, and, uh, well, I'm not sure I know what is English for the big bolt, but the partner uh, exactly well here uh, when the client wanted to meet with him with this particular partner this partner prior to uh, uh, about one hour prior to the meeting he called me uh, and uh, and told the demo we have a meeting in one hour please give me all the materials and explain me everything about the case uh, so uh, in reality I think that uh, there is no need to follow the all the clients, uh, all the clients to do what client ask, because uh, uh, I hardly imagine that uh, I can do to go to Microsoft and ask that Bill Gates uh, sell me the the software. Well, that, I cannot that Apple go. changes his computers because <laughs> you're not happy with them. Yeah, this would not happen. <laughs> Uh, but that's the difference between, you know, buying goods and providing services. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, this, well, this, and that's why the, the hierarchy makes sense somehow in my head. Uh, you know, the, the hierarchy is now quite, how to say it? It's, it's not a simple hierarchy like it was, you know, let's at move, the beginning of... Uh, let's, uh, well, let's... Uh, change a little bit uh, well let's move forward first of all let's move forward and, and, and let's think about about business so uh, we are uh, we set up a law firm to 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 make profit of that right and uh, which structure helps us to scale our business quickly and uh, as much as possible so which structure is better for scaling mm. Actually, um, I don't know, <laughs> because um, what is good for scaling in the services industry? Well, if you come from a, a point of view that it's about trusted advisor only, mm -hmm. you can't scale anyway. <laughs> so it's me, I give the advice, I've got 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and so on. Yeah, so this is not a scalable business per se. This is why legal tech and all these new startups have a real disruptive force onto the market because they scale, yeah? So I think it's a different discussion, really. Um, I don't see the direct link to either a hierarchical or um, an agile uh, organization. The only, perhaps, link I see is that an agile law firm, or you run, sociopretty, whatever, is much more open for innovation and it's much better to change quickly, to react, to adapt. And um, these days the market really requires, at least in Germany and Europe, uh, law firms to change, to adapt to legal tech. And I think an agile organization is much better in doing that. So if this is part of scaling, um, I see agile uh, at the first spot. 
Well, I think that uh, in the last century, the hierarchy was the best corporate structure for scaling. Because if I, if I want to open the office in Kazakhstan, I find the partner there, this partner find the senior lawyers, sen and also I, I hire the junior lawyers, and I have a partner and I have a hierarchy. And, uh, uh, and I have a partner, for example, in, in the UK, who is um, uh, high in the hierarchy of that guy in, the, in Kazakhstan, and it works, and it worked. But now, uh, I'm not sure that in this century, hierarchy is good for scaling, because something has changed. And I suggest to think about what has and, and to speak about what has, what has changed mm -hmm. and why and how to deal with that. But prior, but before we start talking about that, Irina, what is your uh, opinion about about the scale and, and what is what's and which structure is better for scaling for, for the law firms? You know, uh, I think you dare mention Kazakhstan because <laughs> I did an open up it there, mm -hmm. and it's not about hierarchy. It was about the culture. So uh, the hierarchy, in my frame of reference, is definitely better to control things. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to opposition, scale, uh, opposition, <laughs> uh, uh, illusion of control, you definitely oh, have. Okay, okay, illusion yes. of control, you definitely have. But yes. you know, in, in the head of owner. This is the only structure how to control this organization. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, <laughs> Law firm partners and micromanagement, they are completely, you know, they, they symbiotically exist in my practice. You can't avoid that managing partner going through the office and doing something like micromanagement. Just, you know, not in my world, not in my life, maybe next life. Mm. But, uh, so th th yeah, there, there is illusional control, but it's still on the same scale. You can do this control thing 24-7, you know, exhausting partner at all, but definitely you can do it. Uh, for scaling, <laughs> the, my experience is for the good scaling, you need to combine, definitely recognize local culture and accept that some level of control needs to be done. And shared responsibility might be the good answer in this situation. I mean, not in, in last century. I'm talking about like, we had opened offices in Kazakhstan, maybe it was 2009, 2010. So it's like seven, eight years ago. This was a combination. And, uh, I don't know where you want to move our discussion, Dima, but I want to propose we move it to the terminology. It seems to me that, you know, once in a while, you need just to put new tags on all things. And, it, and not about the whole holacracy approach, but in some uh, part of it, I see just new tag on all things, good things. What do you think, Joe? Um, uh, no, <laughs> definitely not. Um, uh, so 100% not, because at least, well, I, I don't work in a holacracy law firm because there's no holacracy law firm in the world as far as I know. My experience comes from encode.org, yeah? So holacracy run and holacracy is part of the legal agreement of the LLC. So ownership rights, investor rights, yeah? And nothing, really hardly anything, is like things I've ever <laughs> experienced before in traditional. I work with Freshfields, traditional law firm. I'm at the traditional elite private law school in Hamburg. <laughs> yeah. I've seen many, many law firms from the inside. Um, I can really tell you that culture, structure, individual behavior, and individual attitudes are completely different. I don't see anything, and it, it really, to me, personally, um, this is the best thing that happened in my life, life apart from my family, <laughs> that I can work with ENCODE, because it challenges me to the very, very um, high extent, but it gives me so much satisfaction, this combination of purpose and very, very um, fruitful and professional work in another setting, 
Um, I've, I have never experienced this before. I can't compare it to anything I've experienced before, really. I'm really happy to hear it, but what the practice meeting is, like, uh, you know, in, in, in normal, let's say normal, hierarchical, law, traditional law firm, uh, the tradition, I'm sorry to say it twice, tradition yeah. of a practice meeting is a quite uh, mirroring, in my frame of reference, the meetings you have in the holacracy system. Say that again, sorry, I just didn't right. hear you very well. The, uh, the sound, yep. the sound uh, I think the tradition of practice meeting, yes. regular practice oh, okay. meeting. Okay. That's very yes. similar to what you, you, yes. you told about the meeting in Halakrasi. Definitely. So the meeting structure on the operational or tactical meeting, yeah, that is comparable. And you can also only introduce this meeting structure to a conventional organization and change it a bit but you will never, ever have the change you have when you introduce governance meetings and when you introduce holacracy to ownership rights and investor rights. This, what we do it, is really different. But yes, for the meeting practices only, I agree. Irina, Joe, I, I see that we need, uh, we need to compare holacracy to hierarchy now because what Irina try, tries to say, as I can see, is that Holacracy is very similar to hierarchy, right? And we just we just have Not another very similar, but there but there are a lot of moments that we can you know find there and there. Let's compare these moments. Let's compare and see where are the differences, and are these differences good or bad? Mm -hmm. So uh, okay, let's I don't know start. Where to start. Um, yeah. So we've got, let's stick with the three areas, operational meetings, governance, so work governance, who has which authority, who has which accountability, and the third, ownership rights and investor rights. So um, I, I, Irina, personally, I have never experienced um, a meeting in a law firm that is run comparable to a holacracy tactical meeting. I have experienced many awful meetings where law firm partners talk for five minutes and talk and talk and uh, it's never facilitated. So I haven't had this experience in operational. I definitely haven't had it in governance because governance is it's a power play, it's ego, yeah, and roles are given out by informal or formal hierarchy, but not by a decision-making process. And definitely you would not have it in ownership. So all partners have one vote in regarding profits and so on. And in at least in Code's world, um, you don't have that any longer. So uh, there's no, no members meeting deciding on profits and every member has a vote. This doesn't exist any longer. So I really don't see comparable but give me an example and we will I, think I'm, I am working in context where law firms in size are far 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 from the law firm you have experienced with so like you know the medium-sized law firm in uh, uh, in Ukraine is like 20 25 lawyers yeah. so it's quite a small environment mm -hmm. so that's why I see in my context there are no so much difference but I agree with you, the current meeting, they never involved all, uh, all, um, uh, all lawyers because they are not partners. Mm. And what do you think about VitaRight? Because I love VitaRight in partnership. Uh, you love it? <laughs> well, there is, I love, there is uh, I love it. And I tell you why. Because why do you love it, Irina? Why? I, I, I tell you, I saw uh, when VitaRight can be just, you know, the stuck point because of ego. But from the other hand, it may save partnership from a huge mistake where emotions very high when they are making decisions. Mm -hmm. So the bitter ride is like a stop point, a pit, a pit stop, just to calm down, to take another round of discussion, because you, you just need to tell, uh, you just need to talk to this partner and you know, bring him back to partnership to the same ground and to the unanimous decision. That's why I love Peter. Okay, so I tell you, Encode has a better answer <laughs> to make okay. right. So first of all, Tell all interpersonal stuff is dealt with in the space for interpersonal relationship, be it conflict or positive or whatever. 
and it can't be mixed during a meeting. So if something interpersonal happens during a governance or not, you mustn't talk about it. No chance, and you won't. Yeah, you have to swallow. But you can be sure that you will have the chance yeah, to deeply explore interpersonal differences whenever you want, a day later or an hour later. Yeah? And so you don't need this to come down because you have to come down because meeting procedure doesn't allow you to show your emotions or to get a response to your emotions. Secondly, we don't need a veto right because we've got this integrative decision making in governance. Yeah? It's not about vetoing and it's not about uh, loving the decision. It's just saying, okay, I can agree to it or I still can't, so my objection has to be integrated. But it uh, just has, integration only has to go that far that I say, okay, so I, I bear this decision, but I don't have to love it. So it's something like in between, yeah? So we don't need veto rights because we've got this process that is very structured and very strict how to integrate objections without emotions. I'm really happy and I'm really jealous of you when you can, you know, you separate personal yeah. and individual stuff. That's probably, you know, I never seen in my life. Yes. Me neither yeah, before, no, Irina, but since ENCODE, I'm experiencing this and it's great. Uh, yeah, it's really great, but you know, we all, it's, it's also human to bring our personal stuff there. And yes. that's probably where we go into uh, quite, quite an interesting, quite an interesting question for myself. Uh, is it more for younger people? No, because I have so a lot of uh, a lot of publications that you know middle age. You know, I'm quite old. <laughs> so I'm me. I'm me uh, too. Hang on. So at, and there are a lot of a lot of studies how middle ages can uh, adjust themselves to agile to. All this new, yes. new managerial style or managerial yes. system. Okay. Irina, Joe, Irina, Joe, uh, uh, may I please comment on on your voting, uh, on your uh, voting idea? Uh, in, uh, I think that in holacracy, uh, you cannot just block the the, the uh, discussion because you do not uh, because of your ego. Uh, you just need to integrate why you are opposed to the decision. And you have to integrate your idea with, with the one who suggested something. So you can you cannot block it. And but it works only with the right people. Because there are people who uh, really can bring their ego to the meeting and use emotions. All we are humans, we have use our emotions. Um, and uh, let's move to the other interesting question. Uh, Dima, yes. just before you move, you just described the Vita procedure in law firm partnership, as I see it. Yeah, <laughs> and that before we move on also, Dima, um, I want to answer to Irina. I don't think it's specific to a certain age. At least at ENCODE, our age, age range is between 28 and 72. So it works. <laughs> um, but you need, uh, you need partners or members who want to, who may and who can apply these processes of self-organization by free choice so it's not for everyone and it's not meant to be for everyone it's like a framework for those who want to work this way you know, when you have the same ground because hierarchy is also have to be accepted by people not all yes. people can work in hierarchy that's why we have holacracy yeah sure yeah. Well, I, as a managing partner, can come to the office in the morning and say that starting from today, we work in holacracy. So this is how holacracy works. Uh, well, it was a funny joke. Uh, Irina, yeah. when you when you told about the age, did you did you uh, really man uh, did you really wa wanted to say about uh, millennials? Uh, yes. Do you think yes. that the problem the problem uh, is that we uh, we are following the marketing about the millennials and we believe that we need to build a, a different ecosystem for millennials but in reality it is really just the same and we just need to uh, need to be honest with ourselves that uh, millennials does not exist and uh, we just need to to manage them with with the uh, old instruments of hierarchy my strong opinion and no offense uh, please no offense but my strong opinion is 
the new generation is uh, a generation with a quite specific psychological needs. They need to be part of something bigger, but they have a problem with attachment. That's a psychological context I uh, mentioned in my letter to, to Joe, so I, I will use it sometime. So the, from psychological uh, point of view, the millennials need something, I call it new toy. So you just need to bring new things, put, as I said, put new tags on old things, just to entertain them, just to give them, you know, um, a special treatment, let's say special treatment. Mm -hmm. That's how I see things. It's not about holacracy, it's not about hierarchy, it's not about bad, good, uh, privileges, uh, disadvantages, it's about to deal with new generation, to involve them and to have their productivity at a high level, you need to entertain them, to include them and Holacracy do it perfectly. Mm. <laughs> you want an answer? Yeah, well, um, um, I probably answered to you, Dima, what you said earlier, what has changed? And um, I think two, there are two big streams of change in the world right now. The first is technology or digitalization of the economy and of society, um, blockchain and whatsoever. This is the first stream of change. And the second is a so-called democratization of the society. This has been triggered perhaps or pushed by the so-called millennials or Generation Y or whatever you call them. Um, and yes, I know I, I work at a law school. Yeah, we've got these people around <laughs> every day and I see the problems you've described, Irina. But I don't see that telecracy is an answer to entertain uh, millennials with a psychological problem. <laughs> I see holacracy and sociocracy and other agile methods as an answer to something that is in the world, um, yet apart from any millennial. So it's, it's a need and desire and a longing for something bigger than yourself, for uh, having a purposeful work, for knowing what you're here to in the world. And um, I don't, uh, perhaps millennials do a bit too much of this desire or interest but it's in the world and it can be balanced. And yeah, we show, yeah, for us, we find yeah. our answer. Uh, yeah, the small the reservation, the small reservation. I've not told there is a problem. I said there is a difference. Mm. There is a difference. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity, it's, right? It's a difference. It's just uh, different. Ira, uh, Ira, Joe, uh, we have a couple of questions in the in the online uh, from the online translation, and uh, the first of them is to Joe, uh, and maybe to myself also. Uh, is there a size of a company or a project when holacracy becomes a chaos? How to not <laughs> let it happen? Okay, these are really two questions. So the first part of the question is, is there a maximum size of partners? Yeah? To no, is there a size of a company when holacracy becomes, becomes a chaos? Well, right, what is the max, yes. maximum size of the holacracy? Yeah, yeah. Right. so that's the first first part of the question is, um, the biggest really known company I know of is Zappos in the US, and they have 300 or even more. Um, yet employees still yeah so people working so and it's not a chaos um i don't know whether it can scale too much more i haven't had experience in these kind of organizations we are currently 12 or 13 partners so a small number at encode.org and then read the second part of the question dima how not to let this happen oh yeah how not to let this happen um yeah, I actually don't think it happens. Um, how not to let this happen? If you stay strictly with holacracy as a rule set and you have people trained in holacracy and accepting it and separating interpersonal issues from it because you have another space for it, then I don't think there will be chaos. And, oh, then, and the answer is your purpose must be a strong and combining element of doing business. So really what you, what you line up to is your purpose and this prevents you from chaos together with the strict rules. Well, my opinion is that any, any businesses uh, are 
Well, well, okay. I worked only in a couple of, of companies, and in that companies, I was not sure that uh, everything is properly managed, and that, uh, and I always felt like there is a, a chaos in, in in a company. Either it was a small chaos or it was a big chaos. But anyway, I think that we all live in the uh, in the chaos and each company works in the chaos because business is, is a chaos. You cannot predict what will happen uh, in one month or in two months. You can maybe predict what will happen in 10 years or in 100 years, but, but, but not in one year, uh, even uh, especially in, in Ukraine right now. So I think that management and different approaches to, to management of the organization is, is just the way how to, uh, how to manage this chaos good of that. Uh, so uh, uh, the second question is to Irina. Irina. Dima, let, let, ah. me comment, let me comment on the previous, uh, previous question because it is quite juicy. Uh -huh. In hierarchical structure, you definitely know what uh, when the house chaos happens. If you have more than four layers in your hierarchy and if you have more than 160 people, that's become unmanageable or you need to have a substructures. And I completely on the same page with you. The new way of managing organization, the new way of organizing uh, the structure it, and teams, it's definitely the answer, the reaction on this unpredictable or how it uh, quite, you know, new term VUCA, VUCA world. So volatile, uh, unpredictable, blah, 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 all these things. So, and hierarchy, definitely. And there is the weakest point. Can do something quite quickly. I can't can't adopt very quickly, because you know, you just depends on uh, top managers, on their decisions. Like in family, you know, parents will decide. Even if you can do something, right here and right now, you will never do it. Or in rare cases, cases do it because parents can decide and parents will you know take care about it. That's the weakest point of hierarchy I can see right now, here and now. And the question to you uh, is sound like, how do you mitigate the biases of hippos in the hierarchy? Hippos? <laughs> high potentials, yeah, high yeah. potentials. Oh, that's quite an interesting issue. You'd better have them, you know, promoted to partners before your competitors just stole them from you. Mm. That's not about so, creation. It's so. about, you know, just a competition. It's war for talents. It not depends on hierarchy or, you know, holacracy. It's war for talents. Uh, well, I'm not sure what's, uh, what exactly Andre means by uh, the, by the um, acronym HIPPOS, because I think that it's the... High no, potentials. It's, no, we, it's are, we are talking about the same thing. It's high potentials. So it's you know quite valuable. Uh, uh, your your quite valuable. No. Uh, or maybe or may Andre, please please describe the this this notion because I think that he means that a highest paid person in the room uh, okay, in means case. means the guy who who has the highest salary in the in the. Uh, for example, on the negotiations, and probably this can be the partner, and his uh, and his voice is the last one. So I think that the question was about this situation. Oh yes, highest paid person, highest paid person's opinion. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not about highest pay; it's about weight of your voice in a partnership. It's not definitely the same. It might coincide, but not always. Uh, well, let me give you an example. Uh, you have a meeting about about I don't know the 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 uh, litigation which the the company supports, and uh, you have a meeting about the legal uh, about the I don't know discussion of the legal grounds uh, of this litigation, and uh, who has the last voice? How to do? Either it is a partner who is the hippo, or it can be, uh, or his his voice and his position can be uh, argued. 
you must see no relevance. I really see no relevance. If we are talking about, you know, considering which position to take in the court, all opinions are valued. Because, you know, not high, high paid person at the stacks, client at the stake. I see the difference, Dima and Irina, perhaps regarding management decisions and client work. I think client work is really the domain of the partner doing the client work. And perhaps he or she would ask for feedback yeah, on a like, friendship level or whatever. But regarding management decisions, we could have a situation like that. For example, should we open up one office in Kazakhstan? Yeah? Whose voice is heard the most? Or should we close down Berlin office? Or yeah, should we make Irina to partner? Yes or no? Um, this might probably be um, a use case for the question. And I, I think, no, and I I, think I, I what's really. behind the question is not so much the, the person who gets paid the most, but about informal hierarchy. It can be someone yeah, like the senior partner behind the scenes yeah, who's informally the most influential person and he will he or she will exert this influence by indirect means most of the time i think it's uh, it, the issue of culture if you can uh, dispute with the with the uh, authority or you cannot i, I yeah. think it's no uh, it have no direct connection to hierarchy or holacracy because you can just uh, feel shy i don't know disputing with the authority or you cannot well, we must, uh, Ima, or another quite important, uh, quite, uh, quite important, you know, the, the, the way of discussion or answer on this question uh, might be if we have considering conflict of interest. So who would decide, he, uh, who would decide are we taking the clients, uh, these clients or not? And uh, have you heard about this recent quite, you know, well-known case with a white case partner? Uh, and uh, the disqualification and punishment and so on and so forth. So that the there is where some influential or high paid partners may, you know, practice their power. The conflict of interest. Well, my feeling is that the question was about uh, like when manager partner comes to the office and says that he wants to change the color of uh, I don't know of, of the printer in the office because because he doesn't like it because he's the highest paid guy in the company so he should decide so his voice is the last one. Uh, well, fine. Let's finish with that question uh, and uh, we have eight minutes left. Uh, so. Uh, Let's move to the final question. Uh, what the company of the future will look like? And to somehow define this future, what the company of 2030 will look like? Okay, let me start. Will we so, still have the law firms in, the, in 2030? Yeah. So my answer when I prepared was no more law firms. That's the future of the law firms if they continue this way, both ignoring technology and ignoring new way of working. There will be products and scalable things and uh, no qualified lawyers doing the same work. Um, so this is Richard Suskind et al. <laughs> um, but I hope, or not but, I hope, um, how will a law firm look like in uh, 2030? It will be purposeful and highly profitable at the same time, but not profit driven. It will be flexible regarding working hours and lifestyles and so on. There will be a good mix of male and female partners at work and there will be a good mix of male and female responsibilities at home and there will be distributed authority. They are all partners. Hmm. Well, you prepared for, for the answer. <laughs> Thank did. you. Uh, Irina, <laughs> do you, you know? Uh, just a couple, couple hours ago, I registered a new company in Bulgaria. It takes me 15 minutes. I was sitting on my balcony and all, all I need to do because because I'm a foreigner go to notary and you know notarize my uh, signature uh, in the presence of translator that's all so I agree with Joe if law firm goes as they go now you know it, it's not a good way of uh, doing things technology is definitely doing doing something with any business on the planet and law firm in particular 
but technology uh let's you know the technology is technology itself but people are still you know humans and all people uh still need as a good communication is the value of themselves and uh you know how i see law firm of the future we're talking about law firm of the future uh, i may say there are already some of them on the planet like shared responsibility only equity partners never matters where you're working in europe moscow you know delhi or whatever uh all valued female and male i agree and what i especially love about hierarchy it's mentoring so you know the the elder and experienced people they're obliged I'm sorry to, you know, they must to produce uh, a new talents. They must produce new talents. I have uh, a discussion with one of a very known uh, Ukrainian law firm partner. What, what is the elite law firm? How you can describe elite law firm? Is it a client base? Is it, a, you know, maybe profit or revenue or whatever? And, you know, we discussed it like for months. And then decided that maybe one trait of a law firm, elite law firm, is this law firm still producing talents and producing new partners. And you know, they are sharing power of uh, developing this law firm and responsibility, of course. I think that the ideal company is the one where I uh, love to work. Well, uh, just a few hours ago, I received a paper about the uh, financial results of, uh, of the companies of the Magic Circle. And uh, I highlighted uh, the uh, one, one phrase of, uh, of the guy from Accenture. He told that if you try to hang on to your legacy business, you will lose. Uh, one half of the Fortune 500 have disappeared, uh, disappeared over the last 10 years because they failed to move on to the new. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, as a result of, the, our, of our call, uh, I do not know what is good and what is bad for holacracy or for hierarchy. Uh, and even I think that all this is bullshit because the key is communication. Uh, so th thank you very much, Joe. Thank you very much, Irina. Hopefully, we will have uh, more calls with you. Yes. So, do you have anything to say as a checkout? Ah, well, uh, enjoyed discussing. Um, yeah, I'm ready to do more of this. And also, yeah, welcome or bye bye to the listeners. And it was good fun. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dima. Thank you, Joe. It was a pleasure to chat in with you. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs> bye, -bye. <laughs>